Yo, what's up, what's up, what's up? Welcome inside the opening line, Corey and Benny. One day away from kickoff now, so the excitement's really getting ready to get started. Uh, it's time to start setting some lineups, actually. I was looking at some of that stuff last night. Did another draft last night, hopped in the NFFC uh, room. Me and my brother-in-law sitting out this joint high as gas. Was like, yo, let's do a draft. <laughs> we got one done. So there you go right there. What's good with you, Benny? Yeah, not too much, man. I, was, I spent most of last night looking over some football stuff. Um, you know, threw in a bunch of passing props, which we can talk about later. Went through some expected run defense and pass defense. Who's got the easiest matchups? Who's got the softest matchups based on expectations, defenses, and you know, tried to find some, uh, tried to find some ways to make some money off it, Corey. No doubt. Hold on one second. Yeah, go ahead. Take your time. Um, I have to reply to this text message. See, this is what happens when you get kidney stones. You're not allowed to drink soda anymore. Oh, yeah, that's right. Dude, I've been drinking coffee like it's going out of style right now. This is like my second one already today. <laughs> that doesn't help. That doesn't that doesn't um affect you though. No, the the kidney stone thing is all about um like carbonated beverages. So like I'm not so, supposed to drink beer as much as I had been, and I used to drink a lot of so like you you saw I used to pound Red Bulls like it was my job. So you know basically now I'm uh. Now I'm into coffee and water is, is, is kind of how I roll at the moment. I better pick up on the water because the beer ain't going nowhere. Mm -hmm. So last night, when you hop in a joint, my brother-in-law was like, yo, he don't have no Nick Chubb, right? Okay. He was like, he don't have no Nick Chubb. He don't have no Odell. So he was like, you know, I was like, well, I don't got no Dalvin Cook nowhere. Which I do have one Dalvin Cook team. I think I have Dalvin Cook in the Razz Bowl. So I was like, um, all right, well, we set up our KDS. We shot for the middle of the draft, the like fifth or sixth pick, you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. And uh, we, was, you know, let's see what happens. So sure enough, we get the fifth pick, Benny, you know what I'm saying? Okay. And with five, with one five, we go Nick Chubb. Okay. We come back around. So I'm sitting on the couch, he on the laptop. We come back around, and he goes, what are you trying to do? I'm like, well, what other running backs are there? What wide receiver? I'm like, yo, Mike Evans is still there. Antonio Brown's still there. Uh -huh. He says Odell Beckham is still here. Middle of the second? In the middle of the second. And I'm like, Odell Beckham is still there? This is the 12 team? In the 12 team league. Wow, okay. So that's like pick 19, right, when it comes back to you? Yep. You got to take him at that point. I, you got to take him. He's like, well, what about we starting with two Browns? I was like, man, that's true. You got to take them, though. Yeah, I, I mean, the value, you know, Odell Beckham has been going first round in a lot of drafts, you know, maybe like the beginning of the second round. But towards the end, you're basically towards the end, the middle to the end of the second round. He's still there. That's – you got to jump on that. Yeah, so we jumped on it. You know what I'm saying? Third round reverse came back. We snatched up T.Y. Hilton. Then in the fourth round, Benny, Damian Williams is sitting there. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, I'm starting to get nervous now because the rest of the industry is getting nervous. This cat is slipping to the fifth and sixth rounds of drafts. I heard yesterday where our boy Jeff Manns took LaShawn McCoy in like the fifth round of an expert league draft. Benny, where, 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 what's the deal with Damian Williams? Are we out on Damian Williams now? Because I got a lot of Damian Williams shares. I'm not out on him. I still think he's going to have a pretty decent season here. I mean, it, listen, I, I, I'm going to be honest with you, Corey. A lot of times we look for what happens in the preseason as a way to kind of predict, you know, especially like the third game, the first half of the third game when the starters play, as a way to predict what's going to happen when the season starts. This is kind of an unprecedented situation where, you know, you pick up a running back after final cuts are made on a good offense and he's being talked about as somebody who could wind up as their main back. Listen, I, I looked at the numbers last night, like Damian Williams, when he had his chance at the end of last season was a goddamn monster. Like the guy was putting up 25, 30 DraftKings points pretty much every week, except for like one bad game, like his last four or five games of the season, you know, at a six K price tag, he was going four or five X every time out there. I understand that people think that Shady is going to affect him. And we talked about it yesterday. I think Shady is going to affect him too. But I don't think it's going to affect him to the point where, like, people are, people are acting like Damian Williams has the plague right now. You know what I mean? Like, this is still going to be a productive football player on one of the most – not even one of – on the most explosive offense in the league. I, 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 
I, again, I mean, I understand why you tick him down a little bit. Maybe he's not a second round pick anymore, but I don't think he drops to the fourth, fifth round. Like he has been. I, I, again, I, I mean, if shady takes over, all right, I'm wrong, but I got to see it before I'm willing to, to invest in it. Would you start him this week? I am starting Damian Williams this week in the leagues I have him in. Yep, me too. So there you go right there. All right, so now come back around after Damian Williams pick, right? Let me find this draft right quick because it's going to be interesting now, Benny. We come back around after the Damian Williams pick, and we are in round number five. We take Tyler Boyd. Okay. So after Tyler Boyd, you get Calvin Ridley, DJ Moore, Hunter Henry, Allen Robinson. Duke Johnson goes. Will Fuller goes. Alshon goes. Miles Sanders goes. And we're sitting on the board. And I'm like, well, what do we do here? My brother-in-law is like, yo, fuck it. I was like, what do you mean, fuck it? He's like, yo, let's just go for it. I was like, what are you talking about? He was like, feeling dangerous. I'm like, wait a minute, son. You want to go with the Cleveland Browns stack? He was like, yo, let's go get Baker. Okay. <laughs> Benny, so we took Baker. Okay. Baker Mayfield, Nick Chubb, Odell Beckham. You better hope that Cleveland Browns offense goes off. I mean, listen, it's not crazy, you know? Like, people look at it and say, oh, man, what are you doing? But last year, if you had, you know, Kareem Hunt slash Damian Williams with Pat Mahomes and Tyreek Evans, I mean, Tyreek Hill. Yeah. Tyreek. Tyreek Hill was the number one fantasy wide receiver. Pat Mahomes was the number one fantasy quarterback. And the combination of Kareem Hunt and Damian Williams put up big numbers for you all season long. So it's not crazy to go after an offense that you think is going to be one of the best in the league and have pieces of it all over the place. It's worked before. What, people, what, what scares people is fantasy owners always think, well, what, what happens if – they get into a week where they don't score no points, right? Then it becomes, what happened if that week when they put up a donut is week 15? That's what scares fantasy owners about this whole thing, Benny. See, listen, here's the deal. When you're playing in the league, the idea is to win it. Nobody talks about how they came third in their fantasy league or how they came second in their fantasy league. So when you're building fantasy teams, again, I'm a DFS player, so I look at everything from a DFS perspective. You want the upside if you're trying to win. The upside is when you have all those guys together. Like, okay, yeah, what if they have a bad week? Like, everybody's going to have a bad week. You know, I don't care who it is. You go look back at everybody's numbers, you're going to get a bad week from every single guy. Maybe it all happens together and that sucks and you lose the game. But what about the week they put up 50, Corey? Exactly. The week they put up 50, you got 250 fantasy points that week and you blow everybody out of the water. So there's an upside and a downside to it. And in fantasy, when you're trying to win the whole thing, when you're trying to bring home the ship, when you're trying to get that big you know, cash prize, whatever it is in the league that you're playing, you're not going to do that by playing it safe. You know, I mean, when we make daily fantasy lineups trying to win a GPP, there's a reason why we stack. Because if that team goes off, you get monster points. What happens if in week 15, that's the week they put up 45? You make it to your ship. You know, what happens if you're in your ship and that's the week they put up 45? You're going to win the whole damn thing. So there's an upside and a downside to it. But, you know, the, to me, it's not as risky as people think because you really want that upside. You're trying to capture that upside. You can't worry about what happens on a bad week. You have to worry about if, if they do have the good week, this is a team that can help me win the whole damn thing. You know what I mean? And that's what I tell fantasy owners all the time is weeks 14, 15, and 16 are not guaranteed. They're not on your fantasy schedule. Your fantasy season goes to week 13. Try to get to week 13 before you worry about 14, 15, and 16. Mm-hmm. But speaking of 14, 15, and 16, Benny, the Baltimore, I mean, excuse me, the Cleveland Browns in week 16 have a home game versus the, I mean, in week 14 have a home game versus the Cincinnati Bengals. It's a good matchup. In week 15, they travel to Arizona. Which should be a great matchup with the, with the pace of play. And then in week 16, they are home for the Baltimore Ravens. That's a tough one. That's a tough one right there in the That's championship round. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And the thing about it is the backup quarterback on this team, Lamar Jackson. <laughs> so, you know, it's enough pieces to go around, Benny. You know what I mean? Yeah, no, I, I don't think it's crazy at all. Listen, 
like I said, last year, if you had Jared Goff, Todd Gurley, and, you know, one of the Rams receivers, you were in a good spot. If you had Pat Mahomes, you know, Kareem Hunt, and Tyreek Hill, you were in a good spot. You know, we've seen it in years past with Drew Brees, Alvin Kamara, and Michael Thomas. You were in a good spot. It's not crazy to go after good offenses. You know, I mean, good offenses – or what you want, those are the teams we target every week and daily. Those should be the guys that you want littering your season-long fantasy teams, too. No doubt. Other police pieces on this team that are not Cleveland Browns, I got my Shea Jamison Crowder I've been wanting. Mm -hmm. uh, I got some Justice Hill. Okay. Got Mark Andrews. Got a little MVS, Benny. Marquez Valdez-Scantlin. Okay. Jackson for the first time. Ty Montgomery for the first time. As a New York Jets fan, what do you think about Ty Montgomery coming into the season? I think that Adam – this week? Oh, think, yeah, not yet. Yeah, I, I don't think yet, but I think that Adam Gase will – again, what we know about Adam Gase is he hates star players and he hates good running backs. So he's going to use more I than – one. Neither one. <laughs> yeah. so, so that's the kind of guy that Adam Gase is going to love. I mean, you know, he's the, he's the Jets version of Kalen Balaj, apparently. So it is what it is. No doubt. Hold on one second. Yeah, I can't. I mean, I'm going to be honest. Like, if Le'Veon Bell doesn't have a huge, a huge workload with this Jets team, I don't see how they're going to be that good. I mean, to me, Ty Montgomery at best is kind of like the change of pace, you know, third down receiving kind of back. I don't think you're going to see a lot of, a lot of carries for him. He may be in there on passing plays. Remember, this is a guy who's lined up as he was originally a wide receiver. So I mean. He's a guy out of the backfield that can catch passes, but he's also somebody that you can, you know, basically motion out into the slot or something like that, and, and he can run routes with, uh, you know, with precision because he's done it before. So I think he's a good weapon for the Jets to have. I just don't see his volume being enough to really justify using him, you know, short of somebody getting hurt. You know what I mean? No doubt. Um, got our boy Debo on the team. Got Dallas Goddard. Got Rykel Armstead. Got Taylor Gabriel who I'm, I like, also got TJ Yeldon a little bit later on in this one. Like that. So that should be how the final draft of the year plays out. At least I think it'll be the final draft of the year. I don't know what's going to happen tonight. Um, speaking of which, uh, Benny, in the NFFC, you get a free look at Thursday night's game. Meaning if you have any players on Thursday, mm -hmm. you, can, you can stick them in your lineup at any point. Like, you, like if, I, if Taylor Gabriel scores two touchdown passes, on make, Thursday night. Make, make sure you got them starting, yeah. I don't have to have them in my lineup until Sunday morning. You know what I'm saying? So, the same thing goes with Marquez Valdez Scantling. So, I think that's a pretty cool thing right there. So, if you're in any NFFC leagues, you might want to take advantage of that. Um, speaking of that game, Benny, you start to look at that one a little bit. But before we get to that contest, we got some waiver wires to run uh, this week. Waiver wires open up. Scott's Fishbowl. I know we've already talked about that when I've looked over my Scott's fishbowl. I'm sure you looked through yours. Yep. Gabriel is a player that's on waiver wires that mm -hmm. I think is worthy of a pickup, especially in 12-team leagues. But in the flex, Benny, the flex auction that we did way back on August 3rd, Duke Johnson on the waiver wire. He's going he's gonna to command a pretty, pretty big amount of your fab budget. What do you get for fab over there, 1,000 or 100? 100. 100? What what percentage do you think a guy like Duke Johnson should take? Because, I mean, you're basically talking about a starting running back now on what is usually a pretty high-scoring offense. <sighs> I, I, I liken it to the Phil Lindsay situation last year, Benny. Last year, when Phil Lindsay popped, I went 360. Okay. As mind you, I'm a Le'Veon Bell owner. Right. He went for four, He went for 450. I was going to say, he went for about – again, we do, it on a hundred, we do it on 100, the ones that I was in, but he yeah. went for 45 to 55 last year in a lot of the leagues that I was in, Philip Lindsay, And honestly, ran for 1,000 yards, had a pretty big season. Pretty much was a good investment at 45, 50% of your fabric. Especially I mean, when you get them for 16 weeks. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. When you can pick up a guy – it's a lot different when you're blowing your fab in week 10 and than it is when you're blowing your fab in week one. Because in week one, like you said, you're getting that guy for the entire season. You know, again, Scott Fishbowl um, is running its waivers today. Jacoby Brissett is somebody that's available in almost every league because nobody was taking him when we did the draft. Everybody assumed that Andrew Luck was going to be back. 
that's a two quarterback league with the super flex, Corey. You basically want to be starting two quarterbacks in that league. You know, there's I think 12 teams in each division. So most of the quarterbacks are owned. Yep. That's, that's another one of those guys that should command. I think I put in again, I, you know, I, I don't really care if anybody's listening. That's in my Scott Fishbowl draft. I think I put in a bit of 45 for Jacoby Brissett. And I really don't think I'm going to get him. Like, I don't really need him. I have three quarterbacks, but I still wanted to make sure I had a bid in there for him. I bid 45 on him. And I think it's the same thing for the running back with Duke Johnson. Like, if you need a quarterback, if you need a running back right now, and these guys are available on your waivers, put it this way. If you're not bidding at least 45, 50, I don't even think you have a chance to get him. I'm at 35 right now, Benny. For what, Brissett or Duke? For Duke Johnson. You know, a third of your budget is not crazy. I, I got to be out. I don't think you're going to get him for 35. Like, if you really want him, I think, I think that number has to be north of 40. I'll tell you who my running backs are right now on this team. Uh, Nick Chubb. Okay. Rick Cohen. Rashad Penny. Jimmy White. I like, I like the James White and obviously the Nick Chubb. Um, Tariq Cohen's okay. Who's the other one? Rajard Penny, I'm not a huge fan of. I'm more that's, well, that's, that's the player I would cut for Nick Chubb. Uh, for Duke Johnson, you mean? Yeah, and yeah, yeah for, I'm sorry, for Duke Johnson. I, it would be a very good upgrade, in my opinion. I mean, Penny still has that. I don't know if I would want to cut Penny because if Carson, if Carson gets hurt, Penny's going to be the, the every down back. So, I mean, I don't know if – he's a guy that I think is at least worthy of holding around. You know, I mean, again, I don't know who, you, who, who your I, other – like. I, I, cut, I mean, cut Greg Olson. How many other – what other tight ends do you have? Austin Hooper and Dallas Goddard. That's an interesting one, man, because Goddard's been a little banged up here, and, and he's not really a starter. Like, I like Goddard because I think he has upside. God forbid something happens to Ertz. Yeah. As long as Ertz is there, like, really his upside's kind of capped. You know what I'm saying? Like, he's more of – we talked about this. Like, you know, when you're, when you're doing drafts, if you can get a guy like Dallas Goddard, he could be a league winner if Ertz gets hurt. But if Ertz doesn't get hurt, he's not even really – like, he's basically a, a back-end tight end, too. You know what I'm saying? Understood. I, I can dig that. But you would – I mean, who would you cut, Olsen or Penny? I would probably cut Olsen, to be honest yeah. with you. I think that's the right – I think that's the way to go about it, too. And I, I think I'll up that bid, too. Um, yeah, I'm probably – listen, do I mind blowing half a budget? It's 16 roster spots. So I'm comfortable blowing half the budget. Um, and, and there's IR spots in this league, too. Mm. All right, so uh, I will upgrade that. Also, on this way, Hawaii, Benny, not nothing much. Um, Taylor Gabriel is out there. DJ Shark is out there. Yep. Same. Uh, you're talking, is this Scott Fishbowl or an FFC? This, this, this is um, the Flex. Okay, the Flex League? Yeah, Flex League, yeah. These are a lot of the same guys that were available in Scott Fishbowl. Like, DJ Shark was a guy I put in a little bid for. Um, Willie Sneed, I think, was somebody that was on the list. He's out there. Yeah, he was a guy that people weren't drafting, but he, he could have a little bit of value here. I think I put in a bid for him. Um, you know, the running backs for the Buffalo Bills are probably on a lot of people's lists right now, like guys like Frank Gore and, and TJ Yeldon. Um, yeah. You know, those are guys that may not have gone drafted. And I'm trying to think of guys that I put in, like, fab bids on that were available on my waiver wire that I was like, ooh, you got to grab that guy. Um, obviously like Jacoby Brissett, like we said, you know, he's somebody that's up there. Uh, trying to think who else was there anybody, there wasn't really anything great, right? Like, I mean, you're not, you're not going to go get yourself a stud right now on the waiver wire, you know, Duke Johnson is the best you can do right now. Probably. Like, like I said, Duke Johnson and Jacoby Brissett are the two guys that I think are worthy of big picks right now that are probably available in most, if not all, leagues that drafted and have had, you know, waivers locked up until this week. Uh, yeah, I got to check. I know I got a couple of Andrew Luck leagues that I'm going to have to go ahead and uh, check on those leagues also. Mm -hmm. uh, Ezekiel Elliott, richest running back in NFL history, kind of figured that day was coming. Not only do they get the girly deal, they blow past the girly deal. Yep. Zeke's ready to rock and roll. Saw a great tweet from Dirk and Whiskey. Dirk was traveling back from to Dallas from China yesterday. And Dirk gets to the airport and it's cameras and media and the press all around the airport. And Dirk and the whiskey says to himself, Wow, I still got it. Uh -huh. But he notices as he's walking, they're not coming after him. <laughs> they're waiting. They're waiting for Zeke to get back from uh, where was he? Down to Mexico somewhere, they're right? Where you hanging out? Elliot to get back from Mexico. 
They just happened to run into Dirk Nowitzki while they were here. <laughs> Dallas Airport is apparently a pretty uh, pretty happening place. I don't know. There you go. So shout out to Dirk Nowitzki. Um, definitely a legend. He, trust me, there's been plenty of people waiting in the airports for you too, Dirk. But mm-hmm. now it seeks time. If the deal gets done, what do we do with the Tony Pollard shares? I mean, you're not going to get rid of him. Like, he's still going to probably have a little bit of a role as a passing down back. And obviously, he's got some value as a handcuff. God forbid something happens to Zeke. But I I can't imagine you'd be very happy about it. I mean, listen, I spent most of this morning, as I tweeted out at about 7 a.m. when I woke up and saw the news, um, spent most of this morning erasing lineups that I had made. and You and everybody else, Benny. Yeah, without a doubt. Because nobody wanted to play – with a forty-five hundred dollar Tony Pollard this weekend. I, I mean, I told you, like he would have been a hundred percent on my lineups if Zeke didn't play because the yep. matchup is is a good one and his price was just way too low. So now I actually like this Corey because remember I was saying yesterday, like he would have been sixty seventy percent owned in a lot of tournaments, and, and I couldn't really knock anybody for doing it, and I couldn't not have do it. Yeah, I couldn't not do it myself because it was just too good a spot. Again, not that Zeke's in a bad spot, but Zeke at $9,000 on most of these sites, you know, he's one of a couple interesting running backs in that area. Tony Pollard was the guy that easily stuck out at $4,500 because his upside for that price was just way better than anything around him. So this actually kind of evens things out a little bit and spreads out a lot of the ownership for DFS, which I think is a good thing because now it comes down to figuring out who you really want to play and who the good guys are. So basically what I, what I, what I think is um, as far as DFS goes, uh, as a person who's watched every snap of this football team for the two decades now, uh, Son is a slow starter. He's a fat boy. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. Uh, of course, he was obviously out there in Cabo getting work done, had his team out there. They all say he's in great shape. But Son is a notoriously slow starter. He normally gets rolling as he gets into the season. He's like Shaq. He plays himself into shape. You know what I'm saying? Um, I would fade Zeke this week. I mean, I would start him, obviously. He wouldn't be my, my, one of my – I wouldn't pay nine, nine – I wouldn't pay him that nine for him in DFS. Yeah. I, 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 wrong, I wouldn't start Tony Pollard this week either in any format. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. But if you were to see the long, obviously, you, you throw Zeke in your lineup in DFS. Yeah. I, would, I, would, I would look other, other ways because uh, Zeke is a slow starter. At least he has been to this point in his career. Yeah, I'm going to be honest, I probably won't be playing him this week if I'm only doing three or five rosters. Now, again, if I was doing 150 rosters, you'd be a moron not to have at least a little bit of Zeke exposure because the the guy, when he plays, it's like 25, 30 fantasy points every time. I mean, you know know what's funny, Corey? They already came out and said this morning, they were like, yeah, we're probably going to limit him a little bit this week to 20, 25 touches. I was like, he's getting limited to 20, 25 touches. You know what I mean? Most other running backs, you would kill to give them 20, 25 touches. So, again, we talk about opportunity and how big opportunity is. A guy that's getting 20, 25 touches is somebody that you need to have at least a little bit of exposure to. No, nah, no doubt. And, and, and Ezekiel Elliott, will, he'll, he'll get that work too. Um, everything is situated in Dallas. Amari Cooper, no contract. Dak Prescott, no contract. But <laughs> sorry, sorry, fellas. But do you think that's wrong? I mean, you're a Dallas Cowboys fan. If you were going to pay one of them, you know, isn't it Zeke? I always point back to week 17 last season when they played a meaningless game versus the Giants before the playoffs started. Zeke Elliott didn't play one snap of that football game. Dak Prescott played that entire game. You know what? That tells you right there what the pecking order is. In the preseason uh, training camps, Ezekiel Elliott barely touches the field. Dak Prescott is out there taking every snap, every rep. You know what I mean? So um, it's not a thing. Dak Prescott's a quarterback. He doesn't have the, 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 the strain on his body as Ezekiel Elliott does. And not to mention he also has uh, franchise tag years coming up, which would pay him around $40 million a season. So Dak Prescott would be fine. Uh, I'm not worried about Dak Prescott. Now, do you think do you think they keep him and try to resign him? Because I heard people have been basically saying if you're paying Zeke, you're not going to also turn around and pay Dak afterwards. They can go get a cheaper quarterback, or they can find somebody else to go there. How do you feel about that? What do you think they're going to wind up doing? That Jerry Jones pays his quarterbacks. Um, they're going to figure out a way to get him done. They, they you got they see what that what Dallas did the Jalen Smith and the Lyle Collins deal very yeah. team, very team friendly deals. You know okay. what I'm saying? They get, they're doing these little deals. These are team-friendly deals that help them when they go to try and decide uh, um, uh, Prescott. 
Okay. I honestly do also think that they're press they're fine letting Prescott wait to his to his franchise years also. And if I'm Prescott, I'm fine with that too. You saw how Kirk Cousins cashed out. Um uh doing basically that same thing right there. What else, Benny, happened yesterday? What do you think of TJ Yeldon? I th- I mean again, I don't think he's got a big upside right now, but I do think Listen, if you don't think Buffalo is going to be a good team, which I don't. I don't. TJ Yeldon is probably the passing down back for that team. He's really good catching the ball out of the backfield. As far as running the ball goes, behind Gore and Singletary, the rookie, I don't really see a lot of carries going his way outside of an injury coming along. But if you expect them to be losing a lot, he could find himself on the field a lot as the passing down, you know, running back there on third downs, which I think at least gives him a little bit of value as – a late round guy that can get you something and also as a handcuff in case, you know, Frank Gore goes down or, or Devin Singletary doesn't work out or, you know, some combination of those two things happens. Um, another thing right quick. I'm in my Scott's fishbowl now, Benny. And I do not see Jacoby Brissett on the waiver wire. Did somebody grab him? Was he drafted? That, that's pretty crazy if somebody drafted him in your league. But when do they actually run? Didn't they, they run them today, right? Did they run them yet, the no, waivers? They did not run them yet. They run them today. What is it, noon today or something? Uh, something like that. Yeah. Uh, that's crazy. If somebody already had him in your league, that guy's pretty sharp, whoever it is. Hold on. It looks like he's <laughs> – I don't see Jacoby. Hold on. Wait a minute. I know he was available in mine because I put in a bid for him in mine. But, um, you know, again, maybe somebody, maybe somebody was expecting something like this to happen or – you know, somebody might have just been looking to grab a, a third quarterback. Maybe they were looking at him as, a, you know, Andrew Luck Insurance or something like that. So, he is I, I guess it's, 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 yeah, it's feasible that he could be. I mean, like I said, I wouldn't have done it, but it's feasible. Wow, Benny, he was drafted. This is crazy. He was drafted in, in my Scott Fishbowl League. Like I said, somebody in your league is pretty sharp. That's interesting. Wow. We're, we're very lucky, one or the other. Because at that point, I don't know if I'd call it sharp if you drafted him, but it is what it is. That's wild to me right now that Jacoby Brissett uh, was drafted in this league. Yeah, hold on. Let me see. This is my division right here. And then you look at the draft grid. I'm trying to figure out exactly when it happened, what round. I'm sure it was late, unless somebody really got the drop. I'm looking, you know, this cold, cold, color-coded thing. Where is um, the quarterbacks at? Case Keenum, Joe Flacco, Daniel Jones, Rosen, Tannehill, Locke, Jacoby Brissett. Round 20, quarterback 37. Somebody got a good steal on him right there. That's going to help them out. That was big right there. That same Who was it? Who was it? Does he have the name? Uh, this team is Dynasty League football, Michael Moore. He has Andrew Luck, Phil Rivers, Matt Stafford. Well, that's what I said. He took him as a luck. He took him as luck insurance. Yeah, exactly. And the right, so, I mean, basically, it, it works out. It's kind of a wash for him, right? Because he probably I, took a quarterback. But yes, yeah, he, pro- he probably took Andrew Luck early, and he's going to get nothing out of that. So the fact that he got Brissett late really is just like, you know, you, you just sub Brissett in there for the Andrew Luck pick of where it was in the draft. So really, he doesn't get that much of an advantage about it. Yeah, no doubt. Um, add drops in this league. Um, the kid, Agumba Wale, the running back in Tampa. Yeah, he's available in mine, too. I put a bid in for him. Yep. And I put a bid in for Taylor Gabriel. How much you put in for um, Agumba Wale? I put in 19. Okay, I don't think that's crazy. I, I, I honestly think this kid's going to have a bigger role than people understand for the same thing we were just talking about with TJ Yeldon, right? Like, if you expect – that team to be playing from behind and he's the passing down guy, he's probably going to get more work than he's running down guys. Like, you know, Ronald Jones from everything that I'm reading, apparently can't catch a football or pick <laughs> up a, or pick up a block. Like literally the only thing he can do is run, which is really the only thing Peyton Barber does too. So you're not going to get any carries for a Goomba Wale, but he seems to be the only guy in that team that can catch a ball out of the backfield. So I think he's going to, he's going to be on the field a lot more than people realize. I'm also picking up Taylor Gabriel in this one, uh, Goomba Wale. Uh, Goomba Wale is the pick I, I like. I'll be picking up a lot of uh, Goomba Wale. Um, so there you go with that one, Benny. Let me see. Check around on some other waiver wires. Now, what was that? some of that stuff you said you was looking at last night? Yeah, so basically what I did last night is I was looking over um, expected 
schedules, right? So basically what they do is they look at the defenses, they look at, you know, the improvements that defenses have made or the negatives that they have lost on their team. And then they do like a strength of schedule thing. So one of the reasons why I think people are so high on the Arizona Cardinals this year, the Arizona Cardinals actually have the easiest expected pass defense that they should be facing throughout the year. Okay. And they also have one of the top five easiest run defenses again. So basically the defenses that they face this year, they, they pretty much have one of the softest defensive schedules in the league. But I'll give you the five teams that have the easiest pass defenses. Um, you know, again, expected pass defenses. It doesn't mean that somebody didn't get better that we don't know about. But basically what they do is they take last year's stats and, and the new additions and stuff like that. And they give each team kind of a score. And then, you know, they go through your schedule and they, they add up all the scores to see who has the easiest. So Arizona ends up with the easiest pass defense to face this year, which means if you've been invested heavily in that passing game in Arizona, you have the softest schedule that they're going up against. The Carolina Panthers are number two. The 40 they don't have no Panther wide receiver. I, I have a little bit of Curtis Samuels. I don't have any DJ Moore, but I do have a little bit of Curtis Samuels. Um, and, and I do have one or two Cam Newton shares, so I don't hate I that. Cam Newton in the flex. So San Francisco is the third softest defenses face for past defenses this year. And I got a ton of Debo, ton of Debo. Debo. Debo's in a good spot for week one, Benny. He, he is. He may be startable week one. He, he is in DFS. I mean, in DFS, I think he's a guy you can look at because we're expecting that to be a high-scoring game. Tampa Bay has one of the worst sets of cornerbacks in the entire league. NFL history. Yeah, well, that's true. And they were horrible last year. Like you said, you got to see how they are this year. But it should definitely be a spot that people are picking on this year as wide receivers against Tampa Bay. Um, and then, again, San Francisco has that matchup. So a guy like Jimmy G is not a horrible play in week one. Um, you know, Debo Samuels. I mean, again, I'm not a Dante Pettis guy. we got to see how that whole situation works out. Uh, but I think Trent Taylor is actually banged up and may not play, and he was somebody they were expecting to have a, a role in San Francisco. So I think San Francisco wide receivers are something you can look at there. The fourth softest schedule belongs to the Minnesota Vikings, Corey, which and, I think is good. Football, but that's it. That, but you're right. That's good, too. It's going to open things up. And I, and I have I had some Kirk Cousins shares that I got late because Kirk Cousins was like quarterback 20. Uh, Benny, it was crazy. It was like he was hated. Yeah, and, and one quarterback league, like you said, he even went undrafted in some spots. And you know what the funny thing was, Corey? Last year, his numbers last year were actually better than the numbers he put up in Washington. So he actually – people are like, oh, he had a shitty year last year. He had a very good year last year. He had one of his best years last year. They were year. expecting a deep run in the playoffs for the Vikings, and that didn't happen. So I think that's what kind of knocked some of the steam off of Kirk Cousins last year. But the Minnesota Vikings are going to be an interesting team this year. And then the number five softest pass defense after the Vikings is for our boy Jameis Winston and the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. They can be able to light it up too, Chris Godwin, love. There it is. It's time, y'all. Y'all, Chris Godwin, people, make sure he's in your lineup this week. and Make sure you play him in DFS too. This is the time. This is what you, you, you went out there and paid that second and third round price tag for your boy for. So go ahead and get him. Let me ask you a question, Benny. Would you start Brissett or Mariota this week? Brissett. I agree. I don't even think it's a question. I like to me, that's not even close. It's wild that it's come to that. <laughs> it's crazy that it's come. I'm the number two. Mariota was number two overall pick. Remember that coming out of college? Yeah, him and Jameis. That was the big debate. Yep. Um, will people be picking up Nelson Aguilar next week? He's on a ton of waiver wires. I... I don't. Th I, I mean, I just don't see how he gets volume, right? Like, I, I just don't see it because. You have Alshon on the one side. You know, you, you have the Sean Jackson over there now on the other side. You still have the tight ends who are going to be guys that get a lot. I mean, there's a lot of offensive talent on that Philadelphia Eagles team, and I think they're going to spread it all around and everybody's going to get a little bit of a piece of it. So, you know, if you're in a real deep league, you probably shouldn't be on the waiver wire. But if you're in a, you know, six, eight-person bench league, you know, he the waiver wire is probably where he belongs. If you're in a 10-team league, don't pick Nelson Aguilar. Well, yeah. league, maybe 14 and greater than yeah. I can see it. Right. Um, should uh, Rashad Higgins be on 12-team leagues right now? No. I agree. Uh, Michael Crabtree? No, I don't I wouldn't. I, I, is, is he, what team is he even on right now? Because he got <laughs> caught, didn't he? He played for the Cardinals. Yeah, he's yeah. on the Cardinals. Put it this way, the Cardinals have a whole bunch of, like, rookies and young guys out there. If you can't crack 
If you can't crack the lineup on that team, then no. I don't think you're going to have much fantasy relevance this year. You'd be picking up Chris Hogan. Nah, probably not. 14 team, probably. 12 team, no. Yep, I, I, I agree. Um, just looking through some of the waiver wire names. And even on the 14 team, he'd be on your bench. Like, it's not a guy that, I'm, that I would be looking forward to starting until bye weeks came and I needed to. Would you be – would you be – what about Rob Gronkowski? Yeah. I'm, I'm just asking, Benny. Like, if you, if you have a spot, you know, I mean, if you have a spot and it's a deep bench kind of thing and you just want to throw him in there, he's on waivers, and you say, you know, it's a lotto ticket, right? Like, you're hoping that – you're hoping for the home run at some point. You saw that video of him talking and almost crying about how he couldn't sleep but five minutes at a time, how beat up he was? Uh, listen, he's – he lost a bunch of weight since he retired. He looks good right now. He's got a bunch of money. Yep. I mean, as much as he had a brain before he started playing football, you know, he doesn't have any, anything wrong with him at this point in time. He got a bunch of rings. You had a, arguably a Hall of Fame career. Like, if I'm Gronk, man, I walk off into the sunset right now. I don't think you know, it's he's, He just started a CBD or he's working with a CBD company. Yeah. The exactly. wellness CBD company. Like, got to fix his body. Well, you know what? Do you? That's what I'm saying. Is like there, you had other interests besides football. Go, go look at him, man. I, again, I didn't knock Andrew Luck for walking away. I'm not going to knock Gronk for walking away. Dude, football's a tough game, man. Your <laughs> your body takes a beating, and you know what? You and I can't get out of bed right now, and we didn't get beat up for ten years playing NFL football. So, you know, when these guys are forty and fifty years old and they can't walk around to go play with their grandkids, you're going to wish you hung it up a couple years earlier and you know get, got your health back. So. I have no problem with it. Gronk, I love you. Stay retired, bro. I agree with you, Benny. I, w- I would say that to be the right way for um, Rob Gronkowski. Changing up uh, the subjects right quick, Benny. The, the USA basketball team. God, I really... <laughs> Go ahead. Go ahead. Go, go where you're going with it, and then I'll, and then I'll say my piece. Like, my thing is, okay, it's, it was a scare. You, you don't have scares every week. Like, they were lucky to beat Turkey yesterday. Uh, Very Jason lucky. Rolls his ankle. They have – um. he'll be out for the next two games. Listen, Popovich is a great coach. I'm not saying that the team misses Coach K. The team probably misses some of the top-level talent. Yes. From the, from the NBA, Benny. And um, this is going to be – this is going to be a tough stretch right here to win this cha- – to win this FIBA. Yeah. I, <laughs> I mean, listen, I think there's two things going on right here. One of them is that the world has gotten better. Yeah. You know, we're not head and shoulders above every other country in basketball anymore. We're not the only country with a professional basketball league anymore. We're not, we're not the only country who has NBA players on their team anymore. You know what I'm saying? So that is one a- aspect of it. The other aspect of it is, and I don't care what you're saying, I love Kemba Walker and there's a lot of good players on this team and all that stuff, but we're not going to win the championship sending our, our, our D squad. You know, we're sending our D-list celebrities over there to play in this tournament right now. You don't have your James Hardens. You don't have your Anthony Davises. You don't have your LeBron Jameses. You don't have, you know, you don't have the best play, the Russell Westbrooks. Like, if you have Russell Westbrook, LeBron James, James Harden, Anthony Davis out there, we beat everybody. Mm-hmm. None of those guys are playing. No. So this is not – every other country is putting out their best basketball players, right? Like Greece, Giannis is out there on the floor. Yeah. The, the shooters that they have on the side, those guys are all European League players. You know what I'm saying? It's not like, yeah, they don't play in the NBA, but these guys are playing basketball at the highest level over in Europe. These guys are studs. These are guys that could come and play on an NBA team. They just probably would be a rotation guy as opposed to being the superstar over in Europe. But these guys can play. These are the best players that Greece has to offer. You know what I'm saying? Even though they lost yesterday to Brazil. But these are the best players that every other country has to offer. We do not have our best team out there. No. Not even do we not have our best team, but some of our best players are already hurt. You know, Jason Tatum's hurt right now. Kyle Kuzma's hurt right now. So we're down to the third string of our D-list team. And that's going to be tough to win a championship with. So, I, again, I mean, I'm American. I'm obviously rooting for America to win. But there is not a single prayer that I'm going to put any money on this U.S. team. I do not have that kind of faith in it. Yeah, nah, it's uh, it, it looks pretty tough for Team USA this week. I mean, in in this um, in this tournament, uh, the futures had the futures market see the U.S. drop down to minus one forty. 
This is a team that was plus 9,000 at one point, Benny. <laughs> yeah, so that's, that's what we call closing line value. You did not get very good closing line value if you took them at plus 9,000. No doubt. <laughs> or minus 9,000, whatever it was, yeah. Yeah, my senior had minus 9,000. So, um, yeah, that number has uh, come all the way full circle, Benny. A um, little bit, uh, quick little college football for this week. Looking through um, some of the uh, schedule, we have no matching on Thursday night because uh, the NFL game kicks off okay. that night. But it's a couple of interesting bets. There's come a couple of interesting spots this week. I think Ohio State has an interesting spot at home. And um, we get into some other stuff. Uh, both Carolina we, – we had a couple quarterbacks go down. USC lost their quarterback. Mm-hmm. And Stafford also lost their quarterback. I take those two teams play this week, so that's another interesting spot. But we'll get you that uh, broken down as we get a little bit later on. Now, would you would you play against those teams this week, figuring that they got a backup quarterback coming in? Uh, I would I would more or less leave it alone. I think the two teams okay. play each other, Benny. Yeah, they play oh. each other. <laughs> oh, all right. So we got two backup quarterbacks. So really, this week it doesn't matter. But you know, well, uh, uh, okay. play each other. I messed uh, up. under taking the under in that game. Then that's probably be the best bet right there. Let me write that down. Stanford USC. I gotta look at the over under there. Now I didn't mess this damn thing up right here. I hit the button by accident, Benny. So now y'all are looking at us in a different way. But <laughs> but we, uh, I want to say a couple more things before we get out of here and stop screwing with everybody. Uh, Benny, why do the Mets always lose games like they lost last night? I, I think it comes down to coaching. No, I mean is that is that not the is that not the excuse? Or just the Mets. They've also listen. I want to say this though: the Mets have also won a couple games this year where. You know, they were losing in the eighth or ninth inning more than they have lately. I think part of it has to do with they actually have some guys that can, you know, hit some home runs and, and turn things around pretty quick right now. You know, I mean, obviously, Pete Alonso being the big one. But with that, you also wind up on the, on the wrong side. I mean, variance works both ways, right, Corey? Like, you get lucky sometimes and you win games you probably should have. You probably shouldn't have. And then at the other side, you lose some games that you probably should have won. So, you know, at the end of the season, that stuff tends to even out. The Mets had a ridiculous run. Remember, like, when the yep. trade deadline happened, I already had buried them. And I was wrong. I'll admit it. When I'm wrong, I'll admit I was wrong. They had an amazing run after that. I feel like now they're starting to give some of those games back that when they were having that run, they found a way to win. You know what I mean? Yeah. And that's what happens, too. It's like with UCLA and Cincinnati the other night, that, 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 that bet that I hit. UCLA fumbled the ball in their own red zone twice. Mm-hmm. Big part of me uh, winning that bet. Let me tell you something. I knew that bet was coming back all week. And when Bo Nix threw that touchdown pass on that last play of the game and I had Oregon plus four, they, they, that's, they came back. That's the thing about variance, and that's why I always say to people, like, if, you're, if your idea of sports betting is I'm going to go all in all the time, you're going to end up broke because even when you have your money in the right spot sometimes, variance just happens and you're in the wrong place. That's why you got to bet a portion of your bankroll – every time you see what you think is an advantageous situation, because even the best sports bettors, and again, I know Vegas Dave never loses and he's got a hundred percent winning record, but most sports bettors, good ones are winning like around a little over 60% of their games. And if you're winning over 60% of your games, you're a very good sports better and somebody who can do this profitably, but that still means you're losing four out of 10 bets. There you go. And that's being profitable. All right, Benny, do you, do you have any bets for the night before we give out these big pizza chickens and get out of here? You know, like I said, I was looking a lot at expected um, past defenses yesterday. So the bets that I have were all season long stuff. But let me drop some stuff for you. Basically, what I did is I looked at our perce- projection system over at Fantasy Guru and I compared it to the over unders being offered on passing props in the NFL. For those teams that I said that had the really easy pass schedules, Arizona, Carolina, San Francisco, Minnesota, and Tampa Bay. And I was trying to find places where our projections were higher than the over-under. So there were a couple of them here. Um, Jimmy Garoppolo, 25 and a half touchdown passes. We have him projected for higher than that. You know, again, soft uh, pass defense schedule for them. So I took Jimmy G over 25 and a half touchdown passes on a year. Uh, Kirk Cousins over 27 and a half touchdown passes for the year. You know, another guy who we have projected higher for that, over under, minus 110 on that one on both of those. Like so this. I took Jimmy G over 25 and a half, Kirk Cousins over 25 and a half. And then a um, couple things on the receiving side of it. Uh, Kittle, five and a half touchdowns. I took the over on Kittle, five and a half touchdowns. We haven't projected for like seven, I think. 
Um, Stefan Diggs, 950 receiving yards, seven and a half touchdowns are his over under projections. We have him projected for over both of those numbers. As long as Stefan Diggs stays healthy, I think he does get over both of those numbers. I would agree. Yeah, so I took the over on Stefan Diggs, 950, the over on Stefan Diggs, seven and a half. And I'm going to give you my favorite one, Corey. Um, DJ Moore, I took the over on 875 yards receiving for him. Yeah. But that's not my favorite one. The over under on DJ Moore touchdowns this year is three and a half. I love that. You yeah, so I, that to me, that was the one that was the most off. And we have him projected for like, I want to say like five to seven touchdowns. So that's a sizable jump over three and a half. Three and a half is not a very big number to reach for, for who's arguably a number one receiver on a team that has – the second softest pass defense expectation for the year here. So DJ Moore over three and a half touchdowns is probably my favorite bet on the entire season. There you go right there. That's Benny breaking down some season long futures for you. You get that stuff right here on the opening line. Don't forget the entire elite fantasy sports network, elite, elite fantasy for your DFS fantasy guru for the season long heads. And of course the sports betters, which are all of us, it is elite sports betting.com for my main man, Benny Ricciardi. Corey Foster, the fantasy executive. We are out.